heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. So today we're on the second petition, which is, Thy kingdom come. And, and I'm especially, I've divided this into three presentations, three uh, about half an hour presentations. The first one is on our Blessed Mother, the second on St. Joseph, and the third on Jesus. And I had, I had originally had Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, but then I was reading the Gospel of St. Luke, and um, it said when the shepherds went, they found Mary and Joseph and the child Jesus. And so I wanted to do it in the order that Scripture presents them to us. And so first I wanted to um, comment on how God always arranges circumstances in such a beautiful way. And a few months ago, I was talking to Cindy Gilbert, and um, I said, Cindy, you know, I'm worried because I know your wedding is set for January 8th, and we're going to be giving a retreat that day in Dover, so um, I, I don't, I'm not going to be able to come. And she said, well, um, it's actually delayed, sister, so I'll let you know the date when I find it out. And so it, it was the delayed date was April 23rd, but many of you know um, that the Lord took Cindy to himself before the wedding could occur. And so I was thinking about that as um, I prepared for this, and today's gospel, like, couldn't have chosen a better gospel because... St. John says in his gospel, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. And I want to tell you that uh, a week ago, it was the Feast of Mary, Mother of God, and I came out of Mass in Holy Rosary to the gathering space, and Jason, who was Cindy's fiancé, was there, and he was talking to several of his relatives, and so I started talking with him, and he said to me, you know, sister, Cindy always wanted a Christmas wedding, and she sure got it, but not to me. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> because that was what I had been thinking. I was thinking, behold, the bridegroom comes, you, you know, but I, but I didn't want to say it to him because I thought, well, you know, that would be kind of, maybe he would take it as being rude, but then he said it to me. Um, she, she sure got a Christmas wedding, but not to me. And, and nothing could play it better to um, the theme of today's talk of retreat, which is thy kingdom come. You, you know, what is the kingdom that we're, that we're um, praying for when we pray to our Father, thy kingdom come? It's the wedding feast. It's the bridegroom who's inviting us because we're all called as brides of Christ to the wedding feast because the church is the bride of Christ. And, and sisters, in a particular way, we represent that mystery personify the mystery as brides of Christ. That's why we wear a, a veil and why we wear a wedding ring and a habit because we're trying to remind the people that this life isn't the only life. There's, there's an eternal banquet to which the Lord is inviting us, for which he created us. And so our real healing comes when we become, like Jesus said in the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That, that's what we're looking for, is the kingdom of heaven. But in order to find it, we have to be poor in spirit. And what better illustration could I give of being poor in spirit than Cindy's fiancé saying to me, she always wanted a Christmas wedding, and she sure got it, but not to me. And he was smiling, you know. I mean, what, what a witness to the faith that was. One of the most beautiful I've ever seen, I think. And I'm going to tell you about another um, another funeral that I went to two days ago. Um, later on in another one of the talks, there was another illustration to me of great faith. So thinking about our Blessed Mother in particular, um, how does our Blessed Mother help us to find that treasure of the kingdom of God? Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. He who finds it, hides it, and in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So, so what is this treasure of the kingdom like, and, and how do we come to it? It's we have to, we have to become poor, 
what we have to, I really shouldn't say we have to become poor because we already are poor. What we have to do is we have to recognize our poverty. And, and our Blessed Mother does that more than any other human person ever. If you think about the words of the Magnificat, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior because he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. Um, there's a story of, um, I read about this mystic who, uh, I don't remember her name, but she was blind and, and she used to hear the angels and um, one of the angels spoke to her and, and said, at the time of the fall of the angels, the good angels were, were so grieved at, at the fact that God had been, that the, the bad angels had so wounded the heart of God by their um, refusal to obey that the good angels were in such grief. But then, as we read in scripture, a great sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And, and this angel said, when we saw that, we saw our blessed mother, we saw her humility, we were consoled for, for all eternity because we saw the beauty of her humility. And so that's what we have to enter into today is um, our blessed mother's poverty of spirit. And to be poor in spirit means that the kingdom is our only treasure. And that's really hard for us because, you know, I think... I've been a sister now for 41 years, and um, I'm still, like, struggling because, you know, I have all my own agenda. I have my own idea of what I think God wants me to do. And it's much preferable to me than what he really does want me to do. <laughs> you know, because it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier. And so, in order for me to become poor in spirit, I have to give up my own agenda. And I don't like to do that, and he knows I don't. So. So there's a struggle going on here. But I think it's a struggle that's in all of our hearts. And I'm, I'm going to illustrate how St. Joseph in a particular way um, overcame that struggle. But let's think first of all about our Blessed Mother. And we hear in the scriptures that when Mary, she kept in mind all these things, pondering them in her heart. And when we hear the Gospel of the Presentation and the prophecy of Simeon, Simeon took the baby Jesus into his arms and he said, Now I can die in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of every nation, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and a glory for your people Israel. And then he said to Mary, he said, um, This child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be contradicted. In thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And so, I, I've, many times I've, I've meditated on that scripture, thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And, and I just, it was always mysterious to me. And this week I was praying about it, and I was, I was asking God, well, who are the thoughts of hearts revealed to? because you already know the thoughts of our hearts. And, and so what I found in my prayer was that the thoughts of our hearts are revealed to our Blessed Mother, to Mary. Thy own soul, the sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So they're revealed to our Mother. Be, because Mary's only a creature, but, but because she's given the role of Mother of God, the thoughts of our hearts have been revealed to her so that we can approach her and um, pour out our hearts to her. And she's always attentive. Y you know, my own mother died in 2008, on December 27th, 2000, no, actually 2009, December 27th. And, um, you know, prior to that, every Sunday night, my mother would always call me at 9 o'clock and we would talk and, um, for years and years. And she would write me a letter every week. And so when I would talk to my mother on the phone, I would tell her, like, all these things that no one else in the world could care less about, you know? <laughs> Everybody else, like, if my brother or sister would say, great, that's really interesting, you know? <laughs> but, but my mother, she was like, oh, really? Yeah. And like, she would listen to all those things. And so when she died, I remember Father Bill Gaffney said to me, well, when your mother dies, your home is in heaven. 
And that's so true. When your mother dies, your home is in heaven. And I mean, if you had a mother like mine, because I had a really good mother, and I know maybe some of you didn't have that experience, but but you do have a perfect mother, and that's the blessed mother. So when, when your mother dies, your home is in heaven. Like our home is in heaven, and our mother is there waiting for us. But she's also here on earth. But we should always remember that she's there, because no one can bring us to Jesus better than our blessed mother can. And some of you had the, the blessing to attend one of the Sacred Heart missions given by Father Bill Gaffney and Gloria Hansen when they gave those missions um, in this area several years ago. And I remember Gloria saying to, um, in one of her talks, she said, you know, her husband was named Jack, and, um, and she fell in love with Jack. And, um, and she said, you know, I really want to know more about him. So I went to his mother. And I said, tell me everything you know about Jack. <laughs> and, and so uh, I remember that story because that's the role of our blessed mother, is to, to tell us everything she knows about Jesus Christ, her beloved son. Because she has the capacity within her immaculate heart, she has the capacity for the whole human race, the capacity for God. And, and that's the heart that God gave us. As, as he was dying on the cross, he gave us Mary to be our mother. So don't forget about the fact that she's there and she's listening. And um, but like you have to develop that rapport with her. She's waiting, but you know it's easy to forget she's there because we can't see her. But but in Fatima, when she appeared to the three children in Fatima, at first only Lucia and and um, Jacinta could see her, and the boy Francisco he couldn't see her. And he said, well, what are you looking at? And they said, well, don't you see the beautiful lady there? And, and he said, no, I don't see anything. And so then Mary said to Lucia, tell him to pray the rosary and he will see me. And so Francisco started to pray the rosary and then he could see her. So, so it's a big lesson for us in that, I think, because, you know, we don't see our blessed mother with our physical eyes. But, but if we pray the rosary and we become devoted to the rosary, and first, when you first start out praying the rosary, it's, it's really hard going, you know, it's, um, it seems long and um, it just seems like there's, you're not getting anything done. But, but if you keep on with the rosary, God will open a door and it, it's a door to his heart. Because the rosary draws us into the heart of Mary. And, and that's why she always asks us um, to pray the rosary because she wants to have that rapport with us. So let's think about, um, again, Mary's heart being pierced. So, so uh, her, her soul, I mean, I had Sister Hebrews to look this up for me, whether it's in soul or heart, because in um, the confraternity it says, thy own soul the sword shall pierce. And that is the more accurate translation to the Greek. But um, the more modern translations usually say, your own heart, a soul shall pierce. So, I mean, there's, there's a similar meaning there. But, but I, when, it, when you use soul, it reminds you of Hebrews chapter 4, where it says, the word of God is living and efficient. It probes the thoughts and motives of our hearts, and it pierces between soul and spirit. So, the, li the word of God is living and active, and, and that's the word that... God wants to put into our hearts, but our hearts have to be open, and so maybe that means they have to be broken. And um, one thing that I've noticed is um, is that the more people suffer, it, the more faithful people suffer, the greater becomes their capacity to love. You know, because there's two ways of suffering. There's, there's suffering with rebellion, or there's suffering like Jason Hammond's suffering with an open heart. And, and that kind of suffering increases a person's capacity to love. And so nobody has ever suffered, no human person has ever suffered more than Mary. Because when you think of how she loved her Jesus and how she welcomed him on the first Christmas night and adored him continually during all those years of his hidden life, along with her spouse, St. Joseph, but then, knowing that he was going to lay down his life for us, and that she had to consent to that, 
She had to consent to that will of the Father. And so I was meditating also on um, the loss of the child Jesus in the temple when Jesus is 12 years old and the, the Holy Family travels up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, uh, for, for the Feast of Passover. And it's important to think about the fact that Nazareth and Jerusalem are 70 miles apart. You know, so it wasn't like an easy journey to go from Nazareth to Jerusalem, which they did every year to celebrate the Passover. And so when he was 12, they went up. And that was the age when, when boys would go through this, a ceremony that we now call Bar Mitzvah, where they would then be considered to be legal adults. And so Jesus was taking on the role then of a man. And so that's why the 12 year old was significant, the age was given in the scriptures. And so when Mary and Joseph leave, like because they were traveling so many miles, they would travel in caravans, like big groups of people together. And the men would travel with the men and the women with the women, and the children could travel with either the men or the women. And so it happened that Mary and Joseph left Jerusalem to go back to Nazareth with a whole group of people, and they so Mary assumed that Jesus was with Joseph, and Joseph assumed that he was with Mary. And then at supper time, when they came together after having walked a whole day, they found he was not with either of them. And so they went back to Jerusalem. But remember, they had walked a whole day. And so then they had to walk a whole day back. And on the third day, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And they were astonished. And his mother said, Son, why have you done so to us? Behold, in sorrow, your father and I have been seeking you. And Jesus said, How is it that you sought me? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And, and it was that's so mysterious, that whole thing, that whole interchange. And then, um, then the next line says, And they did not understand the word that he spoke to them. Mary and Joseph. So think about that. I mean, the two holiest saints to ever live on the earth. And they did not understand the word that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. And his mother kept all these things carefully in her heart. So we, we need to think about how even Mary and Joseph needed that overshadowing of the Holy Spirit to understand the word of God. And that they had to submit their intellect when they didn't understand. And but what, what I was thinking about that I never thought about before until this week was, um, you know, because usually I think about the grief of Mary and Joseph and losing Jesus and not knowing where he is. But I was thinking about the grief in the heart of Jesus because he loved Mary and Joseph so much and he knew how much they were going to suffer from his being absent those days. But he had to follow the will of the Father. And that was what the Father was asking him. And so we see in the Holy Family, we see especially the sacrifice of their affections. You know, there was no holier loves than the love between Jesus and Mary and Joseph. But, but they had to lay those loves down on the altar and make God be first, which was, was very, very painful, but which is what brought the kingdom of heaven to the earth. And um, we see it in Joseph, I'll talk about that when I talk about Joseph. But one time um, in Medjugorje, the seers asked our Blessed Mother, they said, how come you're so beautiful? And Mary said, I'm beautiful because I love. Love and you will be beautiful. And so we think about that because, um, like, like when I began to talk with telling you that story about Cindy and Jason, I mean, that is so beautiful to me. It is so beautiful. Because if, if only everyone could have that perspective, you know, because from a worldly point of view, Jason, um, you know, people would think, oh, Jason must be so embittered against God because um, he took his fiance, you know, took his fiance just a few months before their wedding. I mean, that would be the worldly point of view. But, but that's not his view. Be because he's found that treasure of the kingdom of God. He's able to make that separation between his affections and the will of the Father. Because whatever we give to the Father is going to come back to us a thousandfold, a thousandfold. 
but it's just a matter of how can we get to that point of trusting. And so it's Blessed Mother and Joseph and Jesus who are going to give us that ability to trust. And so I think you probably have all heard that story about that little girl who, um, she had this plastic necklace that she loved so much, and she always had that with her, and she was always wearing it. And one day her father asked her, um, give me your necklace. And, um, you know, she just didn't want to do it because, you know, it meant so much to her. It was like her favorite thing. And, um, but finally she did. She, she gave it to her father. And the next day he gave her a real necklace that would have real diamonds in it. And, uh, and so the lesson of that story is that's the only reason the Father is asking us to become poor in spirit is because we really don't have anything to give except our poverty. Like, like it says in the book of Revelation, you thought you were the rich and you, you, you didn't need anything, but really you're the poor and miserable and blind and naked one. And I counsel you to buy me, to buy me gold refined by fire, and to anoint your eyes with eyes so that you may see. And so when we give God our poverty, when we come before the Father and we say, Father, I don't have anything to give you except my sins and my, my sorrow for my sin and my poverty. I give you everything that I have, and all my love, Father, and all my life I give to you. Then he's going to give you back the real treasure. That's what he's waiting to do today. Mm -hmm.